Well, so glad to be here today and excited to teach today on uh, purpose and calling. Actually, oh, what did I do with my clicker? Did I leave it back there? Um, I put it somewhere. I'll be needing it. It's amateur hour. That's right. What did I do with that? All right, Steve, you can probably preach for a couple minutes while I... We're going to find this thing. Oh, maybe I put it in my office. You know, these are the things. If you don't do it every week, you don't know. This is good teaching. Did you find it? No, not yet. Hold on just a sec. Otherwise, I can play free stuff for you. Oh, you got it? All right. All right. Steve's getting it. That is so funny. Well, then I'm going to have you kind of flip through these uh, a little bit as we go here. I put it somewhere. But uh, anyway, glad to be teaching on purpose and calling. This is, this is kind of part of our... Oh, did you find it? Uh, just kind of, you know, Come I, on, I man. You, you hit it. <laughs> That's so funny. So good. I love it. We had a, by the way, we had a staff retreat uh, this week. We took the staff and all five interns over to Crested Butte. We hiked over, and I've got to commend you guys because Luke and Ashlyn arrived Wednesday... And then hiked over West Maroon Pass, 11 miles, 2,800 vertical feet. I don't know. But they crushed it. And uh, it was so fun just to get over there with the staff and uh, Lauren and Jeff. And where is she? Lexa. Oh, I'm sorry. Lexa, of course, right here. We had such a good time, though. We got to spend some great time together for a few days. We do it every year. And this is the first year. Well, we missed last year because there was so much going on. But um, that was a great trip. I wish we had some pics. Maybe next, maybe, maybe next week. So here's what I want to do. This, I want to just let you know that this is part of our developing uh, just direction for spiritual maturity and discipleship, spiritual formation. And, and we want to, uh, we, we've tried to, to, to ask ourselves, okay, what does it mean to be a mature follower of Christ? What does it mean to to be on that course and traje- trajectory of growth where we're increasing glory to glory, being transformed, you know, continually transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so there are a few categories we've come up with that, that are, are solidly biblical, and they're not some sort of checkbox or anything like that, but they're areas of our life like the lordship of Christ, becoming a new creation, um, devotion to him, immersing ourselves in his community, in the community of the church, loving others, stewardship, purpose and calling, which we're going to dive into today, and then kingdom living, uh, which is looking at, looking at the whole thing holistically and our whole life lived for God's glory and submitted to him. So we're going to look at purpose and calling today. And why are we starting with purpose and calling? I don't know. We've done a little bit before in the past on, on the, the new creation and on the lordship of Christ, but we may come back to these from time to time throughout the year. So we're going to dive into this, purpose and calling. And uh, basically, uh, I'll start with a few quotes today, things that uh, people have come up with about purpose and calling. Here is one from John F. Kennedy. Effort and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. Here's Robert Byrne. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. Here's Helen Keller. True happiness is not found through self-gratification, but to fidelity to a worthy purpose. Would you agree with some of those? I mean, we're going to look at Scripture. We're going to look at Scripture. I first want to show you a clip, though, of... uh, Probably one of the most famous depictions of purpose and calling that Hollywood has ever accomplished. Do you know what it is? It's Chariots of Fire, the story of Eric Little. And that was in the 80s, right? A long time ago. But it is so appropriate, I think, for what we're diving into today. Eric Little was um, a runner. He was a gold medalist in the 1924 Olympics. And you may remember, he chose not to run on Sunday. That was a big deal. And Hollywood depicted that very well. He was not going to run on the Lord's Day. And in fact, it wasn't the, the 
uh, final for the 100 meter, it was the qualifying event. And there was a qualifying event on Sunday, and he's just determined, I'm not going to run. Well, he went on to run uh, the 400, which he was not expected to win because he was a sprinter. And you probably know the story. He won the gold medal in the 400 against all odds. But here is a a little clip of Chariots of Fire. The final of 400 meters. Taylor, Taylor, Etats-Unis. Numero 278. Taylor, Taylor. Don't expect I'll see you till after the race. What's the deal with this guy, Little Coach? Your problem? No problem. He's a flyer. He's had two races today already. He'll die. Just swing along, you guys, and wait. After 300 meters, rigor mortis sets in. You'll pull him in on a rope. Johnson, Canada, number 400. Good luck, Taylor. Watch out for Little. Coach says no problem. He's got something to prove, something personal, something guys like Coach will never understand in a million years. USA, 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 Jimmy. USA, 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 USA. Says in the old book. He that honors me, I will honor. Good luck, Jackson Schultz. Where does the power come from to see the race to its end from within? I believe God made me for a purpose. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I believe God made me for a purpose, he said, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Wow. If you don't know the story, how many of you have never seen that film? I'm a little concerned. Okay, not not as concerned as I was. Go watch that film if you haven't seen it. It's fantastic. Eric Little was a missionary. By the way, he died in China in February of 1945, a few months before the end of the Second World War. His parents were missionaries to China. He was born in China, and he died in a concentration camp. Was that his purpose? He's certainly hinting at something here that I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. So there looks like there are two different things going on, doesn't it? So I want to look at a few things today about purpose and calling. Three things. What's the difference? What are the dangers? 
And how do we discover them? How do we discover our purpose and our calling? We'll look at a couple of definitions here this morning. This for calling came right out of the dictionary, off of an internet search, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. What's the difference? A strong inner impulse toward a particular course of action, especially when accompanied by conviction of divine influence. That's right out of the dictionary. Check it out. There's my search. That's a pretty good definition. I'm impressed that that's still in the dictionary that way. A divine calling. And how are we going to find what purpose is? There's not really a definition of calling in Scripture, but we can find some definition. I mean, yeah, we can find definitions of purpose in Scripture. And one thing I want to look at today is uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, which I don't have with me, but some of you may have this memorized. This was a, a publication by the church in England and Scotland and Ireland in 1646. 40, yeah, 46, or 48. The, the full Westminster Confession of Faith came from that church over there in 1646. And then the Shorter Catechism, was, which is basically just a summary of foundational principles of the Christian faith in question and answer form. Now, how many of you have a Shorter Catechism or have ever had one? Okay, a few. Did, you, did some of you learn that as a, as a kid and study that as a kid? Wow, you did, Luke? Unbelievable. This is an old document. Of course, this is 350 plus years ago and long before even our country was even founded. But it was just to help God's church in the foundational truths of Christ. And in that, the very first question is what? Some of you know it. What is the purpose of man? What is the chief end of man? And the chief end of man, it says, and by the way, these 107 questions and answers all have scripture references to them. It's a very simple and useful tool. But what is the chief end of man? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Very simple. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And you see, I believe very much, and from scripture, we're going to read some other scriptures today that support this, that that is our purpose. And we'll get to a couple of those scripture references, one or two of them from the catechism that they referenced in there. But first I want to read from Isaiah 43, just a few verses. You probably remember Isaiah 43 where it's talking about the Lord. I mean, it's really hard to read that chapter and go, okay, that has to be about Jesus. Uh, For example, things like this, I give men in return for you, peoples, in exchange for your life, in verse 4. But then, it also talks about these peoples, the sons and daughters of God. And listen to this. Here, I'll put it up here. All right, so there's the Catechism, 1648. And look at this from Isaiah 43. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created... For my glory, whom I formed and made. You and I were created for his glory. This is our purpose. You say, well, what about calling? We'll get to that. But this is our purpose. One of the references in the catechism, the shorter catechism, is from 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Do all to the glory of God. What a verse. Is that possible? No? Yeah, well, I I get you. There's a a debate that happens, right? It's like, well, if I'm out out of the will of God, am I doing that to the glory of God? But the point is, in that encouragement, is... Ask the Lord to examine our lives and Lord, put me in your will. Let me learn, Lord, to do all things for your glory, whether I eat, whether I drink, or whatever I do. What does that include? It it includes everything. Yes, right? What's the difference in purpose and calling? 
So, and this may be a, a kind of a danger as well. We have, we've had some definitions of purpose and calling. But I want to think about a danger. I, I know that every one of us has been taken in by this. We have hoped, probably unknowingly, that our calling might be our purpose. Or that, maybe to expand that, that we might get benefits from our calling that can only come from our purpose. For example, I want to be, fill in the blank, I want to be, I feel called to be a, a great businessman or a great father or a great mother, a great husband, a great wife, a musician, an accountant. I feel called to do this. And I think that for many of us or all of us at one time or another, we have, like I said, maybe subconsciously tried to derive the benefits of our calling that can only come from our purpose. Another example is if something doesn't work out, if I put all of my energies into this calling and then something changes, I had my heart set on this. I thought this was of divine influence, but something changes and now I'm kind of pivoting and going a different way. But I hold on to that calling so tightly Things begin to happen to me. I become frustrated, angry, irritated, anxious, depressed, because I'm trying to, you understand, I'm trying to find my purpose and my calling. Those two things are different. To restate that, our purpose is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever forever. John Piper came along and said, to, the, the, he changed one word in that little statement to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And maybe that's for another debate, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it? That if I'm going to glorify God, I may do that by enjoying him and developing that fellowship, that intimacy with him so that I know his voice. So let's restate calling. Calling was what was the definition? A strong inner impulse toward a particular action, especially accompanied by conviction of divine influence. I might remove the word especially. A strong inner impulse toward a particular action accompanied by a conviction of divine influence. I think there's some other dangers just with purpose and calling. I, I don't know about you, but I, I seem to put a lot more time into my calling than my purpose. I, I, we want to develop skills. We want to develop this, this trade or this profession or this thing that we have such a desire for. And we do have desires and passions, you know, for our calling. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit later I think that's going to come out of some things that God has given us. We can look at a couple of examples. I think about Moses and I think about David. Moses was called to lead God's people out of Egypt. And what did Moses say? Moses had complaints and just questions. And he said, Lord, I, I, I can't do this. I can't speak. I don't have these gifts. I don't, I don't know anything. The Lord's like, no, you're my guy. And that may happen in, in your life. Where you're like, well, I just can't do that. That's not something I can do, but God keeps calling you. That's a good place to start. David, on the other hand, David, when, when he came and Goliath is standing out there taunting the armies of God, David's looking around going, I'll do this. What do you, what's wrong? I'll do this. David had some experience. Remember, David's out there watching the sheep and guarding the flock. And along comes a bear and along comes a lion. Along come these very difficult situations where David has already had some experience. 
That doesn't mean he's not depending on God, but that might be how God leads us. That also might be how God leads us through the circumstances in our lives, shaping his will or the spiritual reality through physical realities and guidance. We have to be open to watch for that. So, I also want to talk about this. So, a danger of, of, I think, pursuing a calling without purpose is we, we have to understand that that calling has a context. Our calling has its root and its beginning in our purpose, in our fellowship with the Lord. Our blessing from Him to awaken our hearts, that calling absolutely has a context. And if we don't start there, then you may, you may find yourself in a place where you're asking, well, who called me to this? Because it is possible for us to call ourselves. It is. I think about Samuel. He heard, he thought Eli calling him three times. What, let's, let's read a little bit of that maybe. In 1 Samuel. I want to read just a little bit for you. He heard someone calling. He runs to his mentor, Eli. Hey, you called me. No, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Samuel goes back to bed. Here's his name again. He comes. Hey, you, you, you called me. No, I, I, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And a third time, listen to this. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And, and have you ever called yourself? I have. Speak, Derek. <laughs> well, I'm listening. So that calling has a context. You see, I, I, I know that our calling to hear God's call comes from an ability to hear God's voice. I know it does. It comes from experience of hearing his voice. Time spent in his presence, fellowshipping with him, asking his spirit for counsel, being in his word, learning his will and learning his voice. He says we can know his voice. Last year I took my son uh, up Pyramid. And we went and, and I told him, I said, you know what, you... you you find the route. I want you to do the route finding. And, and I wasn't just putting him in a weird position. I've been up there six or seven times. But I said, you find the route. And I'll, you know, if you get off route, I'll, 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 I'll say something. So we go up and we get to these places and we bump into a few people, these three people who are climbing. And, and they're making decisions, in my opinion, once or twice that are just unnecessary. And they go out on this ledge, and, uh, and Lewis is about to follow him, follow them. And, and I just looked at him, and I said, you know, you sure you want to go that way? He looks at it, and he backs up, and he looks around. And in a minute or two, he goes, no, nah, that's stupid. <laughs> and he went this other way. But what if I was a stranger? I'm his father. We've talked about this. We've had many discussions. He knows he can trust me. But what if I was a stranger? He would have found himself in a position where he just had to make a decision. You with me? So that calling has a context. And an ability to hear God's call comes from an ability to hear his voice. Okay, where are we? So, uh, just one quick point. Our calling is unique. I believe it is unique. No person on this earth has the same set of circumstances, the same set of relationships, the same 
skills and gifts. No person on earth. That is one beautiful thing about God's creation is he created each one of you unique and yet in his image. So your calling is unique, but it's not isolated. It is never isolated. I mean, you could probably think back on experience when you've tried to do something just on your own. It has a little bit of a different outcome than when you're in community, than when you're working with God's people, you're praying with others. Because see, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have challenges. It's, it's almost as if God promised we're going to have challenges. He did say this, give thanks in James 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Just listen to this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And ultimately hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us. We are going to have trials, but isn't that an interesting thing? Give, give thanks. Consider it pure joy. Wait a minute. Sounds a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because my reactions are a little bit different than that when it comes from my flesh. I'm not considering it joy. I'm, I'm punching a pillow. But he says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. You see, God knows when you need help, when I need help, he is there. He is there. And so take that little verse, James 1, and, and, and keep that. And then when a trial comes along or a challenge comes along with your calling in the future, and it will very soon, try to give thanks for that. Try to consider that joy and then pray and cite God's help. Amen? Okay. So I want to I lead us this morning in a... And a, a few things that I'm just calling a reflection. As God's people, we pray. We pray. We meditate on his truth. We fix our eyes on him. I'm going to call this a reflection because I want to just encourage you to... to we, we have to get to calling. I know what you're thinking. Okay, I know what my... That's my purpose, but how actually do I fulfill that in what I do day in and day out? I have to go to work. I have to come home. I have to take care of my family. I have responsibilities. How am I going to fulfill my purpose? How am I going to find my calling? So now that we've dealt with purpose, I want to look at calling and think about some things here that give you a way to pray before God. And I call this a reflection because I want you to just not just think about this, but take these prayers into God's counsel. Take 15 minutes, I don't know. Take them into his counsel and pray these prayers for revelation, for direction, for counsel. Okay? And the first one is this. Oh, we already restated that. How do we discover our purpose, our calling? We've talked about purpose. So here's the first reflection. For how do we discover them? Lord, reveal to me first the meaning of 1 Corinthians 10.31. And that was, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. See, that's going to take a little time, I think, for each of us. To be still before the Lord, in his counsel, having his spirit, our counselor, illuminate what that means for us. Because... There is something on the surface, but there's so much more. There's an ocean of guidance and direction in God's truth and by his spirit. And so I ask you, take this as a reflection for a place, because like I said, our calling is in a context. It's in the context of our purpose. And this verse right here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I believe with the Spirit's counsel will give us insight into those things. How am I going to do all that I do, Lord, for your glory. We're being renewed. We're being transformed. Our mind is being renewed by his truth. Our thinking is being transformed into his thinking, even into his mind. And so I just encourage you, spend a little time with that reflection right there. 
Lord, reveal to me the meaning of 1 Corinthians 10.31. Okay, here's another one. Holy Spirit, what are my passions? What are my passions? If you look at the course of life, it's funny how different things in our life open different doors or different seasons, different relationships. We're looking at the bottom of a tapestry that has all these knots and threads that are going from here to here, but the Lord is weaving something. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. And so as we work out our direction in life, I just encourage you, say, Lord, what are my passions? Holy Spirit, as our counselor, Holy Spirit, what are my passions? Now, here's a little caveat. In the small print, if you're unsure, just to double check, I'm being honest with God and myself, you may want to ask someone close to you the same thing. It's amazing how my wife realizes what I'm thinking or even trying to say, and, and, and it might be a close friend, it might be a spouse, it might be a trusted brother or sister, but if you ask someone that same thing, they will, they will, they'll, they'll give you some insight. I mean, the body builds one another up. They may share something with you didn't even see. You're like, wait a minute, what? They're like, oh no, you do this every day. Every time I'm with you, it will help. And the Lord uses others around us to speak to us. So I encourage you, take those two reflections. Take the first one to the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you take it to your friend first, then to the Holy Spirit to confirm. Here's another one. Father in heaven, what gifts do I need to operate in this calling? Sometimes we want a calling so badly we haven't, we haven't yet been equipped by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And we've done it. I run out and I'm going to work as hard as I can on that calling. I'm going to work so hard. And then you see someone else in that calling and you're like, why does that look so easy? Why does that look so easy for them? doesn't mean we're not going to have times of hard work. Absolutely. But we have to ask God, Lord, what are the gifts I need to operate in this calling? I want to be a great leader of a company. I should be praying for the gift of leadership. Shouldn't I? I, I have these dreams of, of, I don't know, being, uh, having these wonderful parties at my house to host people. Maybe I should pray for the gift of hospitality. I want to be a great mentor or father. Maybe I should pray for the gift of exhortation, encouragement. I have a lot of responsibility and I have all these voices coming at me from all these different directions. I should pray for the gift of discernment. Discerning the will of God. And we've all had this. Life can be so confusing. And the enemy wants to hold us there. The enemy and God are very different. Very different. But sometimes, I believe, we start confusing the way they work. The enemy is out, he prowls about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is trying to kill, steal, and destroy your faith, hope, and love. And sometimes I feel like I have this idea that God doesn't want me to know his will. That God doesn't want to share with me. Or maybe, maybe he's just not going to do that. I doubt whether or not this is going to be given to me for direction and clarity. The enemy is out to kill, kill, steal, and destroy faith, hope, and love. The Lord is the author of faith. 
The Lord is working for your benefit. In fact, he says he uses everything for the benefit of those who love him. That is so different. And we have to proclaim, Lord, I believe that is true. I believe that is true. And so spend some time on that. Spend some time on those scriptures when you come across them and the the Holy Spirit shows you, hey, the Lord is here for your provision, to provide for you, to heal you, to deliver you, to bless you, to give his mercies to you, which are new every morning. We have to proclaim those things to ourselves again and again. To know, Lord, you are, you are here for my blessing. He is good. Someone said it in these qualities we're remembering this morning. Here's the fourth one. Jesus, who receives a blessing when I operate in this calling? Look, I think the first thing we can say, if, if it's just me, I don't think that's really in keeping with its truth. I should probably be able to identify others. You look at everyone in the Bible, all the the saints of old, what they did and what they were called to. Now, hey, it may not work out. Like Samuel, he was called, but it didn't go so well for a little while until later But who receives a blessing ultimately if I operate in this calling? And you know what? That should come to mind for us oh, regularly because that's part of our stewardship. That's part of our gift. The body is here to build one another up. It's, we're for each other's benefit. The word even says we belong to one another. And you, the Lord says, are blessed to be a blessing. So who receives a blessing when I operate in in this calling. And I've spent some time on these things. These are just five reflections that I want to encourage you with. There's one more. Lord, how may I glorify you in this calling? Now remember, we've already talked about the context of this calling. It is coming out of his purposes. And as I said earlier, who called? And if he called, Lord, show me how I may glorify you. There are so many different callings. And we have many at once, don't we? You're uh, a father. You're a businessman. You're a a server. um, You have all of these communities or these small communities that you're involved in. All of those things require stewardship. And we have to steward those callings. And I don't think we have just one calling. I think God is calling us throughout our lives to different things that we have vision for that his voice has spoken to us and given us the provision. And by the way, when we, when we undertake these callings, you will be given provision. You will be given provision. In fact, if I can do it all on what I have now, it, I, I probably want to question that calling. I'm going to need God's provision. Lord, how may I glorify you in this calling? I want to show you just, uh, I don't know why this came to mind, but a little equation. We'll come back to the prayer of faith. A little equation here for stagnation and for progress. Energy minus excuses divided by fear equals stagnation. Where does energy come from? The Lord. He set everything in motion. Any energy we have, the the breath in our lungs, is God. Energy, excuses just takes away from that, doesn't it? And then fear divides it again and again and again. And I talk about all these worries, all of these fears. It's just, and and, and I can't move. On the other hand, if I add to that energy action, like from James, and I multiply it by faith, progress is going to happen in the spiritual realm. I'm going to move. There's going to be something. I'm going to learn. It's not going to work out. I may have this vision and it doesn't always work out exactly like this. Remember, the Father sees all and he is working in all of our lives to bring about his will. So what I want to close with just a prayer for us for clarity. 
I want to pray for clarity of purpose and clarity of calling. I want to pray for supernatural provision. I want to pray against fear and against anxiety. I want to pray for faith and hope in our hearts. Amen? So let's, uh, uh, Billy, if you guys would come on.